Welcome to the Practical Prophetic, where prophetic ministry is made practical. I'm Beth Wingate, I'm your host, and welcome to the podcast. On our podcast today, by request, we are going to talk a little more about the end times. Today, we're going to give you an end times overview, and I'm calling it 101 because I really want to keep it simple and basic. So what we will do is we will start by giving you the broad strokes, the 50,000 foot view. Then we'll come in to, I don't know, 25,000 feet and we'll, we'll hone in on some things and then we'll come all the way down to the treetop level and get a little bit specific. So hopefully this will make it very easy. I'm a person who likes to use charts and analogies. I'm a visual learner. And so I believe I can break these down in a way using a visual guide for me, but then I can communicate it to you. And hopefully we'll keep this really short. I won't make it too long. The information is vast. The topic is vast and it can become confusing. And so my job today is to demystify the end times, the book of Revelations. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Well, first of all, in the South, and I'm guilty of it, I do it all the time. I'll say the book of Revelations, but it is not plural. It is singular. It is the book of Revelation. And there's one revelation, and it's the revelation that Jesus is coming back as a king to righteously judge the nations. Okay, so that'll help your theology. And I'm going to give you a couple of guidelines as we go. And I want to first, though, start off by giving us a quick story. So my grandfather was a Southern Baptist pastor, and he was very learned and he held degrees and you know he was important in the southern baptist church he went to seminary out in texas and and uh, all kind of places and and was in that whole world and my mother after she became born again she was going to a non-denominational or like a charismatic church and she began to study the book of revelation and so she came to my grandfather who was her father-in-law and was asking him questions about the book of revelation thinking hey he could really help me out and uh he uh he said honey don't read the book of revelation it'll confuse you <laughs> So we were like, what? <laughs> anyway, so that is the attitude of a lot of people in the church. They think it's too confusing. They don't even fool with it. Well, I hope that you don't take that stand. And I, at the end, hopefully I'll tell you why it's important that we study uh, the, the end times and the book of Revelation. There's a special reward in heaven for doing those things. Okay, let's set a few little parameters. Let's put some uh, some bumpers up on the bowling alley here or some guardrails on our road as we go forward. And I got this from Chuck Missler. Now, let me first of all say this. So about five or six years ago, I got really serious about, hey, I want to get my head around the end times and the book of Revelation, Daniel's 70 weeks. I really want to understand these things. And really, it's because I began to study the Jewish roots of my faith. And once I understood the feast days, I understood the importance of studying the end times. Once you understand, and I've said this many times, the feast days, you understand the rhythm of God, because the word feast in your King James Bible is translated in Hebrew to the word moed, M-O-E-D. And we just did an episode on the feast days. You can go back and listen to that. But that word moed, one of the definitions, it means a divine appointment or an appointed time set by God, but it can also mean a dress rehearsal. It's a time that goes around and comes around. It's cyclical. It's seasonal. And that's the way biblical time works. That's the patterns of biblical time. Once you begin to understand those, you understand that that is prophetic in nature. And so once we have a grasp of that, we understand that the end times are important and they have significance to your life as a believer and to understanding things from a prophetic perspective. And so there's so much information. I'm almost overwhelmed. I have six charts laid out here, but I'm going to try to keep this really basic and really simple. So also, let me give you this, some of my influences, and I have a very traditional end times pre-tribulation rapture view. However, 
I am not dogmatic about that view. I do leave room for other interpretation, um, but I lean pretty heavy, like really heavy, 90% to the pre-tribulation rapture theology. But I am open to those uh, other views. There's mid-trib and post-trib, and I have my joke that I am pan-trib, that it will all pan out, which I think is funny. Some people don't think that's very funny. So, okay, <laughs> let me go forward here. Uh, a couple more things. My influences, Chuck Missler, Billy Brim, Perry Stone, Bill Cloud, uh, who else? David Jeremiah, I've used a lot of his charts. Uh, Prophecy Watchers, I really like them. Prophecy in the News, Hal Lindsey, I mean, that's a great one, right? Late Great Planet Earth. Jonathan Kahn, I don't know if I said him already. So those are my influences, especially when it comes to the end times. I really agree with most of what I've heard them say. There's several others that I listen to, but I'm going to keep this basic. I'm going to keep this simple. We're not going to go too deep. I'm going to give us little analogies uh, for the book of Revelation. I have a house that I use as an analogy that makes things very simple. So let's start with the 50,000 foot view. Oh, one more thing. Chuck Missler, something he said that really means a lot to me and why I lean to a pre-tribulation rapture view is he says that your hermeneutics will determine your eschatology. Let me explain that. Hermeneutics is the study of how literal you look at the Word of God or interpret the Word of God. For example, do you believe that if the Bible said that Jonah was in the belly of the well, that that literally happened? And then eschatology is the study of the end times. So how literal you interpret the Bible will determine your view of the end times. I hold to a, a very literal view. I am a, a strict constructionist when it comes to the Word of God. There are people that believe that the Bible is full of analogies, and so they see analogies everywhere. I only see analogies when the Bible tells me it's an analogy and interprets it itself. I'm, I'm very strict about that in my views. And so you have two different views and mindsets out there. For example, I'll give you a comparison. Years ago, I was watching George W. Bush and Al Gore have a debate for the presidential election, and they were both giving a debate. And Gore said he believed, Al Gore said he believed that the Constitution was a living, breathing, evolving document, changing with our times. George Bush rebutted that the Constitution was a finished, perfect document that we must strictly adhere to. So they obviously had two different views. Bush was a strict constructionist as far as the Constitution, and Gore was more progressive in his views, believing that it changed with our times. I am a strict constructionist on our Constitution, and let's apply that analogy to the Word of God. I believe the Word of God is finished, perfect, divine, and that you don't add to or take away unless it tells you. And so uh, I am not very fluid with my view of the Word of God. So there's our bumpers, there's our guidelines, and we're going to go forward. Let us start with the 50,000 foot view. I touched on this last week. I gave us a list of about almost a dozen signs that we are living in the end times. I definitely believe we are a good clip down that road. Now, here's the thing, though. We've been in the end times for some time now. So you could argue that that started in 1948. Uh, some people say maybe even before that, maybe after that. Some people say uh, 1967 with the Six-Day War. That's all debatable, or 68 when they captured Jerusalem. But we're a good ways down that clip, whether, you know, your timing falls somewhere in that range. Some people say that uh, ever since the, the year 1900, we've been on that that time. So there's a lot of arguments to be made for where, but I think we can all generally agree that we're a good ways at the end of the church age. So let me give us the, the big overview, the big macro, the very far up 50,000 foot view. Okay, so we talked about this also last week with the different dispensations, but I'm going to keep this starting with the church age because that's the age we are living in now. In fact, if you want to go everything before that, before the day of Pentecost, was 
Jesus's first coming, the Old Testament, you know, all of those things happened before the church age. But at Pentecost, the church was born in the book of Acts, the, the second chapter of Acts, when the Holy Spirit fell and the church was born. And so the church was born at the day of Pentecost. And now we're going to go forward. And all of this is found in the, the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, I'm going to read it. This is what happens that culminates with the end of the church age. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And that is describing what we call the rapture. In fact, the word caught up there is the Greek word harpazo, which means to be caught away, catching away to be snatched up. Let me also read to you 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to start in verse 50 through 53. And it says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So this is the the events of what I believe is the rapture. So it's very simple. We have the Old Testament We have the Gospels, and then after the crucifixion, Jesus tells them to wait for the promised Holy Spirit. And in the second chapter of Acts, we see the birth of the church at Pentecost. That starts the church age. The church age will end with the rapture. The rapture starts a whole new era, a whole new dispensation. And then we start what I believe is the tribulation. I'm going to break that down. I'm really trying to keep this simple. I really don't want to get too confusing with this. So the tribulation, okay, we can break it into a few parts. And like I said, I'm just keeping this simple. We're not going back through the signs of the end times. We know that it'll be like birth pains. Uh, there's terms like uh, like that used in the Bible. And we know that these things have to come. Okay, so we are now culminated the church age with the rapture. And there's some arguments a little bit about tweaking the timing. But this is the general accepted view. That will start a seven-year period called the tribulation. Now, the Bible oftentimes will say the beginning of sorrows, or it'll say the tribulation. There is a distinction, however, when the Bible says the great tribulation, two different time periods. That's uh, time within a space of time. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation is often in your Bible called the tribulation or the beginning of sorrows. That's found in Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6. Then after what's called the abomination of the desolation, which will happen right in the middle of of that three and a half year period, it will begin what's called the Great Tribulation. So the tribulation is subdivided into these two parts. The tribulation, also called the beginning of sorrows, and then with the middle point there, the fold being the abomination of the desolation, and then you have the Great Tribulation. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ will return with his saints And there will be what most people believe, the Battle of Armageddon at the very end of the tribulation. There are arguments for it to be moved around in a slightly different position, but that's the general 50,000 foot view. Now, what we can do is we can now come in and sort of talk about things within each of these groups. So you have the pre-church age, the church age, the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, which is subdivided into two parts, 
the first being the tribulation, also called the beginning of sorrows. Then the middle of that is the abomination of the desolation. And then you have the great tribulation. And at the very end, you have Jesus' second coming. That's the broad strokes. Okay, so now let's sort of dive in a little bit deeper, and then we're going to shift a little bit. Okay, let's look at the book of Revelation. So in the first chapter of Revelation, it talks about the resurrection of Christ. In the second and third chapters of Revelation, it discusses the church. Then, after the fourth chapter of Revelation, in fact, in Revelation 4 through 19, the church is now in heaven. That's why a lot of people believe that that supports a pre-tribulation rapture view. In Revelation 6 through 19, it discusses the tribulation. And then Revelation 20 discusses Messiah's kingdom. And then Revelation 21 through 22 talks about the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, I like to break this down with my little house chart. (laughs) So I have a little chart here, and I got this from Marilyn Hickey. I didn't come up with this myself, but it is a wonderful way to understand the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is divided into three floors on a house. You have the basement, the main floor, and the upstairs. The upstairs representing heaven, the basement representing hell, and the main floor representing earth. And these are viewpoints, viewpoints from heaven, viewpoints from earth and viewpoints from hell. So in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, it talks about things from earth. Uh, Chapter 1 is about Jesus. Chapter 2 and 3 is about the seven church ages or the church age in general. Chapter 4 through 11 talks about seven, the seven year tribulation from the view of heaven, heaven's viewpoint looking at the tribulation. In chapters 12 through 16, the book of Revelation talks about the seven-year tribulation from the viewpoint of earth. And then chapters 17 through 18 is the seven-year tribulation from the viewpoint of hell, or Satan's viewpoint. And then in chapters 19 and 20, you have post-tribulation events. You have Satan chained for a thousand years, and then Revelation 21 and 22 is the new Jerusalem. So that's sort of the broad strokes. I love the Revelation house because I can see that visually. I like that upstairs represents heaven's view, the basement represents hell's view, and then all the rest of the book is from the viewpoint of earth. It's either, uh, you know, the seven church ages, New Jerusalem. It's, it's all pre and post tribulation, and then also including the tribulation there in the middle. You can hear my papers rustling around. Okay, let's keep it simple. Let's not get too complicated. But now we're going to sort of go into some specifics, which within these major divisions of time, dealing with the end times, the tribulation mainly, but a little before and a little after. So let's talk about some specific things that happen. At the beginning of the tribulation, during that seven year period, I believe just prior to around the time of or maybe just post the rapture, it says the man of sin will be revealed. That is the Antichrist. I believe that will probably happen happen sometime soon after the rapture, but I could be wrong on that. It could happen actually before the rapture. There's a lot of debate over the exact timing. The Bible does not specifically say, so it is open for interpretation on that. The man of sin is the Antichrist. Now, something that a lot of Christians I hear get confused about is there is an unholy trinity that will be revealed during the tribulation. There'll be Satan, there'll be the Antichrist, which is basically a possessed human being, a person, and then there will be the false prophet. And there's a lot of debate over these people. Who could they be? Is it a government leader? Is it a religious leader? Well, I believe the Antichrist will actually be a governmental leader. I believe the false prophet, though, will be a religious leader. Now, there is some debate over the false prophet. Some people believe he's an apostate pope. Some people believe it's a religious leader that sort of uh, pushes Chrislam, or they try to blend Catholicism, Christianity, and Islam. I I don't really see that happening, but that could be it. And then a lot of people who support a uh, Islamic 
paradigm for the end times believe it could be the Dajjal. The Dajjal is some kind of like a chief imam, a religious leader within Islam. And so you get into a lot of debate over these things. Uh, but that's generally what's accepted is sort of this false, this evil trinity, if you will, Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And there's, of course, debate over who these are. I'm not really sure myself. I have an opinion. Now, most end times teachers up until about the 90s believed in a European Antichrist system. Uh, and then with some of the modern prophecy preachers, there was an Islamic antichrist model and i personally though believe it will be both because daniel's statue and daniel's dream it's a 70 week dream uh, i believe that the statue that nebuchadnezzar saw had uh two feet representing rome east and rome west and so i believe that it could possibly be both because rome east was a lot of was comprised turkey and a lot of muslim nations so that's a possibility we don't know yet I'm open to both, uh, but I do believe it will probably be a mingling of both. Okay, so we have the the tribulation has started after the rapture, and the Antichrist is revealed. The first three and a half years are called the beginning of sorrows. That's mentioned in Matthew 24, 1 through 8, and Revelation 6, 1 through 8. And then, like I said, you'll have the abomination of desolation. That's where there'll be false sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem, and that causes a big uproar. In fact, that is also when a lot of people believe that there is a war in heaven taking place. And then you'll have the last three and a half years, which is the Great Tribulation. That will culminate with the return of Christ called the Great and Terrible Day of the Lord. That's found in Joel 2, verses 30 through 32, and Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. That is where Jesus will judge the nations. There will be a reckoning. People that harm children, there will be a reckoning. People that talk young people who are confused about their gender into radical, barbaric surgery, rendering, you know, rendering them permanently scarred, there will be a reckoning for these people. People that hurt the elderly, there will be a reckoning. You know, we're afraid sometimes of judgment, but judgment sometimes is necessary. God is a just God. He is coming back to judge the unbelievers in what's called the great white throne judgment at the end of the seven-year tribu- tribulation. Now, while the church was in is in heaven during the seven years, one of the things the Bible mentions is what's called the Bema Seat. The Bema Seat is a reward, but it is also a judgment, but it is a good judgment. And one of the things that will happen at the Bema Seat, because it says your, your sins will be remembered no more. They'll be burned up like hay and stubble. That's found in 1 Corinthians 3.12. The Bema Seat is a reward system. You know, so when you go to court and someone's done you wrong and you want to sue the person to make it right, you may be given a reward by the court. You may be awarded damages and, you know, all kind of things like that. We recently had a situation where our mortgage company took out a life insurance policy on us and did not tell us but charged us and we were not the beneficiary. And so uh, it came to our attention. It was a class action suit, and we were given all of the money they had taken from us back, plus interest and penalties. And so that was a righteous judgment, an award. We were awarded those damages. And so judgment is a two-sided coin. We always tend to think of it in the negative, but it does have a positive side. One of the things that will happen in the Bema seat is uh, the Lord will take your works, basically, and they will be burned in a fire, and your righteous works will be purified like fine gold and fashioned into crowns. And there are five Christian crowns. I'm going to give you all the scriptures. This may be brand new information to you, but there are different crowns. You know, I was watching recently, I'll sidebar right here. I love genealogy. It's one of my hobbies. And I watch all these crazy 
genealogy shows, and uh, I was watching one. It was actually Australian, because I love any kind of genealogy. And uh, there was an actress, an Australian actress, who did her genealogy, and uh, she did not know her grandfather. In fact, there was a, a situation, and, and the, all the children, her mother and all of her siblings, were farmed out to different relatives after the uh, great-grandmother had passed away. And so she didn't know anything about her grandfather. And even her mother didn't really know anything about her father, very little. She had just faint memories of him. And so it uh, turns out that in World War II, he served in the war in the military, in the Australian military. And um, even though his life was somewhat sad, uh, he became depressed after his wife died. But they found out that he, uh, because he served in the military in World War II, he was uh, awarded two medals that were never claimed. And so the granddaughter was able this actress, to claim the two medals. They did a little tiny ceremony for her, and she was able to present those to her mother. And her mother just broke down crying. It was so precious to her mother because she didn't have anything of her father's. And this was something they could be proud of as a family. So these are the crowns. This reminds me of these crowns, you know, of a job well done. You know, uh, you completed the campaign. You know, you completed your life here on the earth as a believer. And so there's these crowns that will be awarded to believers. Here are some of the crowns. The crown of righteousness in 1 Timothy 4.8. The crown of life in in James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10, the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5.4, the incorruptible crown, and that is in 1 Corinthians 9.25, and the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. And then finally, the incorruptible crown, also called the victor's crown, it's found in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, and it says this crown is awarded to those who discipline their minds through the study of God's word and prayer. These are known as the five Christian crowns. And in Revelation 4, 10, we see the significance of casting crowns before the throne of God. At the coronation of Jesus as king, you will be given the opportunity to cast your crowns before the feet of the king. Oh, what an amazing sight. I'm going to read that for us in Revelation 4, verse 9 through 11. It says, And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. Because of your will, they existed and were created. And I believe we'll participate in that event. And so that's something that happens right at the end of the seven-year tribulation at the coronation of Jesus Christ. How amazing. And we see that in Revelation chapter 20, we see that Messiah does set up his kingdom. And then we see that at the end of that era, which will last a thousand years, it's often called the millennial reign of Christ, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, which which is uh, right after the final judgment. And so there's a lot of things we could have discussed that we didn't, but I'm trying to keep this basic. I want to keep this very simple and keep it uh pretty easy to understand, but I do believe this is a good general 101 look and overview at the end times. I hope today's message blesses and encourages you as you look forward to your moment to cast the crowns that the Lord will give you when you get to heaven so that you can participate in the coronation of Jesus as King. He came first as a lamb, but he's coming back as a lion, a king, a righteous judge. Amen. Have a blessed day.
Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll be informed next time I post. Thank you again and have a blessed day.